Michael Denner, um, Professor of Russian Studies here at Stetson University, and I'm with Dr. Mayhill Fowler, who is, has, um, is a, an Associate Professor of History and Russian Studies here at Stetson University. She's been here at Stetson since 2014? 13. 2013. Um, I helped hire her. I should know better. Uh, and um, she recently um, was promoted and given tenure and um, as part of this whole process um, in academia the year that follows the granting of tenure um, you get sabbatical um, every seventh year um, uh, and um, she took a full year sabbatical uh, and also received a very prestigious Fulbright, Fulbright grant um, that allowed her to travel to uh, Lviv, Ukraine, and Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, she's going to talk about this herself um, and do research for her uh, forthcoming book on wartime theater in um, the Soviet Union and in particular in Ukraine. Uh, and so right now uh, she's in Lviv. Um, and so I wonder if you could tell us uh, briefly your path that's led you there to that apartment and why you're there now? That, that is such a great question. Um, so I left Florida in a hurricane and will be coming back hopefully in a pandemic. So that's been my year. Um, but in between, it's been much more calm. Um, so I had been on a Fulbright, which I can recommend to everyone. It is an amazing experience. And even like with all the contacts that I have in Ukraine, that you have in Ukraine, that we have in Ukraine, it still opens doors, right? It's an amazing fellowship. It's an amazing opportunity um, allowing you to really immerse yourself in the place of your research for a long time. And so I've been working on two projects. Um, the first is my official Fulbright project, which is called War Stories, Theater on the Front Lines of Socialism. Nice title. And it's it about- the, it, has the, it has the requisite colon in it. The, oh, they have to have a colon. Yeah, yeah, they have yeah, to have, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's about um, military theater. So the Soviet Union's military districts sponsored military theaters, professional theaters to entertain the troops, right? Um, so we sent Marilyn Monroe, right, abroad. They had professional academic theaters doing three-act plays for the army. Um, and one of those theaters was in Lviv, which was the center of the Carpathian military district. And that theater is still in operation today. It's not run by the Ministry of Defense anymore, obviously, but it's still a theater. Um, and so I'm looking at that theater as a way of thinking about how we tell war stories and how we put together narratives of war, which is an interesting topic because it was important in the Soviet Union, right? They kept telling the story of World War II um, until the end. And of course, right now, Ukraine is telling stories about its own war with Russia right now, right? They've been at war for six years and there's a lot of plays about it. And um, so I'm interested in how we tell those stories and the power that those stories have um, in shaping society. So that's one project. And then I'm working on another project, um, which is about actresses. It's called Comrade Actress, colon, Soviet Women on the Stage and Behind the Scenes. And um, it's about women and how we can look at theater in the Soviet Union through the lens of gender and we might see different things. We might see questions of labor, questions of survival, questions of what it means to build a career. Um, and these were just some ideas that I have. And then I sort of realized on my Fulbright, because I had the time to sit in archives and read stuff, that I actually had a book project. So um, I've been working on those projects. I've been teaching a class at the university on theater history. Um, but right now I'm in quarantine. So I am in my apartment where I've been for like, I don't know, nine days, more a week. I don't know. I have no sense of time. I don't know. Um, uh, the Fulbright program is officially suspended worldwide. So I'm officially not a Fulbrighter anymore. I'm a Fulbright alumni, which is like super sad. Um, 
the State Department would love us to go home. Um, they have issued a travel a level four advisory, so we are supposed to go home. Um, I feel like flying to JFK is like being evacuated to Stalingrad. So I'm staying here for the time being. I'm lucky to have resources. I have access to food. I have access to um, toilet paper. Um, and I feel safe here. So I'm staying here. I'm staying in my apartment. I'm trying to stay busy and stay connected. Um, it's a very weird time to be an American abroad, obviously. Um, but that is why I'm here. That is why I'm sitting in my apartment right now because so, I'm quarantined. So um, I'm, I'm sure a question that Americans uh, have um, is the general reaction and the feel on the streets there in particular in Lviv um, and just I, I, it should be said and I'm sure that you'll fill in some of this but like like one of the reasons that Lviv is interesting is it wasn't really part of Ukraine um, until um, quite late in the game um, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian yeah. Empire not part of the, uh, of the Russian Empire um, and um, so it's a it has a very different feel from the rest of Ukraine, I, I yeah. think it's fair to say, um, has a very different historical experience. Um, so without going into that too much, uh, uh, like, like, what's the feel, what's the vibe there in Lviv and um, more broadly in Ukraine? Yeah, so it's really different. I think that um, uh, Ukraine is a state that is managing this crisis in a strangely decentralized way. Right. So it's really how people experiencing how people are experiencing it is up to who the mayor is. Right. Um, who is the sort of um, who is the leader in your region? That's sort of more important than who the president is in, in terms of how you experience the crisis. So um, and also there's sort of some other factors. So Lviv is a small city. And so transport is very shut down and not more than 10 people can be on a tram. Um, at once, but you can walk everywhere, basically, right? So it's it's hard to not have the tram, but you could walk if you have to go somewhere. Um, in Kiev, that's not the case. Kiev is a huge city. And so um, just from what I've heard in Kiev, um, the metro has been shut down and transport is shut down. And that's a stressor on a society when people still have to get to work, right? And businesses, um, you know, really should be shutting down, but aren't shutting down. And so sort of the stress of, um, there's a lot more, I think, street stress in Kiev than there is in Lviv. People have been very calm. I live in a very calm neighborhood anyways, but, you know, you get to the store, you wait in the line, you wait in the line, no one yells at you, it's yeah. fine. There's, yeah. there's sort of a resigned, resigned nature to it. And I do think that... Um, you know, I've been very stressed um, the last week, and some of my colleagues in Ukraine have not been. And I think there's something about this generation, which is my generation, people in their 40s who kind of grew up after Chernobyl, right, which was obviously in Ukraine a huge sort of um, stress, obviously. Um, do we stay? Do we go? What do we do with our kids, right? Um, what's safe? What's not safe? Um, you know, they survived the economic crash of the 90s right? When capitalism was just kind of introduced, shock capitalism, um, and they've been at war for six years. So I think sort of the, um, the ability to sort of, um, you know, be happy you can get potatoes and kasha and, um, you know, you're okay, uh, is, is, is perhaps greater than it is for me, you know, sort of relatively privileged American who's like, oh my God, when am I going to get home? Um, so, so that's interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of criticism of the government, which is interesting because we criticize our government too, but it's like in a different way, kind of in a different discourse. Um, uh, and I think how, yeah, I think there's generally more response to quarantine here. In other words, people are actually doing it more than, for example, what I see in Florida. <laughs> Um, uh, it doesn't mean they're complaining about it less, but it means they are sort of doing it more. So 
Um, and there are actually very few cases in Ukraine right now. So it's different. It's definitely a different reaction to state actions, right? Um, and definitely a different reaction to crisis. Um, so but at least it's the color of Ukraine, it's been like interesting to observe. Do, do you think it's helpful to the average Ukrainian to have a frame of reference? So I'll just say that like um, um, the, the stores aren't bare here, but for the first time in my life, um, I can walk in a grocery store and there are aisles that haven't been stocked. And um, if you ask me a couple or three weeks ago, were food shortages a possibility? I would have laughed at you and dismissed it. And now I, I don't think it's likely, but it's certainly within the realm of the the possible now because I can extrapolate from, you know, 10% of the shelves being bare to 100% of the shelves being bare. Uh, and in any case, uh, Ukraine has in its very recent past, um, in everyone's living memory there, multiple times gone through society stressor periods, I think it would be fair to say. So, um, so do you think that it's, 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 that, that this is an example where historical memory is helpful? I, yeah, I do. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I also think, um, there are sort of everyday practices that are very helpful. I haven't seen, again, I live in a very quiet neighborhood, but I haven't seen the kind of hoarding. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I even went with some some very dear friends to um, Ashan, which is like a bigger supermarket. Um, and that was maybe 10 days ago. So sort of right when things were kind of shutting down. Um, and even there, people had full baskets, but like not the same thing I'm seeing in the United States. Um, and oh, there's still, oh, you, you know, there's, oh, there's still food. Please. There's tons of food. I'll just... Like hoarding here, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, you, you, you're 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 seeing media depictions of how Americans are acting, which is possibly, I think, we both are are, are aware can 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 um, exaggerated, yeah, quite distant from the actual lived experience. So, so I'll give you an example of this. Did you know that in reputable Moscow uh, newspapers and um, reputable Moscow um, TV stations, they're um, uh, uh, promoting a story about Lviv, where uh, uh, um, uh, um, but the, there's a, a, a biographical, a real person, um, Banderov, um, who, uh, 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 yeah, um, has a complicated history, but we'll leave it at, we'll leave it at that. Uh, that his adherents in Lviv are forcibly taking people's temperatures, um, and if they find that they have elevated temperatures, they're shooting them and leaving them on the street. Very, very typical of the yeah, all right, really very typical of Russian media depictions of uh, of Ukraine, but in particular Lviv, which, um, for historical reasons, is particularly um, um, uh, the the target of uh, uh, Russian misinformation. I I assume that it's that the Banzirovtsi aren't aren't grabbing people and shooting them on the street. I, 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 no. I didn't lend it. I didn't lend it any credibility. It was the that's Russian. Not that's yeah. not happening for sure. Although there are fines, right? There, the the um, one can get fined for breaking quarantine. Um, and and who knows what that's what that's going to look like. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, or, or enforce that. Or that's what that's going to what that's going to be, right? So. so how um, how did Fulbright handle the its managerial role um, uh, for Fulbright scholars uh, in the light of this pandemic? Um, I have to say, I think they've been great. Like Fulbright has been amazing in that. Um, uh, Fulbright Ukraine is not a separate Fulbright commission. They're part of the embassy. They're part of the cultural affairs division here. It's a Fulbright post. 
Um, but it is a separate office and the people who work there are really great. And they've been very good at kind of negotiating between what the embassy is telling them and kind of talking to us individually and what we want and how we feel safe. So I've been very glad that um, you know, they haven't said, well, you know what? The Chargé d'Affaires says you have to go, so you have to go, that's it, boom, done, right? Um, instead, we've been able to have conversations and I've been able to say, you know, I just, I feel safer here, I'm worried about this and I'm worried about this. And I felt like they've been very understanding of um, supporting us kind of more emotionally through a very stressful time, right? Um, uh, you know, and it's very difficult. I mean, there's the um, the border is closed. There's no air traffic, although there is air traffic, right? Ukraine International Airlines and this other ones has opened up some flights. So, um, but, you know, what flights can you get on? How are you going to link up with another flight through a country whose borders are open? Um, so I think they've done a really good job at managing people who, helping people who want to leave, leave. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of managing those of us who want to stay kind of managing, managing our lives. Um, it's got to be incredibly complicated. I can't imagine. Yeah. And cri crises, I think by definition are, um, 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 lacking in rules. Um, and in, yeah. and, and <laughs> that, that's what make a cri makes a crisis a crisis a crisis. Exactly. Is that, that people don't know what they should do or what they can do. So, um, with that question, um, could you leave? Ukraine right now? Could you leave and come back to the States? There's a there's a flight tomorrow morning from Kiev to New York. Um, and a couple of my Fulbright colleagues are literally driving from Lviv right now. Um, you know, buses and trains are shut down, so they had to get a private car. But they're going to Kiev Borispol Airport right as we speak to get on that flight tomorrow morning to JFK um, and then linking up hopefully with flights to their final destinations. Um, there's another flight that- oh, You know that they've they've closed the New York City airports to flights out. Yes. So this is a flight coming in. So, but hopefully, but again, I feel like it's a risk, but it's, but some people have to get home for other reasons, right? So- It, it seems like they're um, arbitraging risks there. They're, they're trading risks for risks, which sometimes makes sense, but um, mostly, known risks are much better than unknown risks and it seems to me that they're trading known risks for wildly unknown unknowable or shifting risks and that that, that doesn't make a great deal of sense to me yeah i think it's a calculus though of 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 comfort right and i think um for me i'm i'm I mean, A, I hope I get out, right? This, this will be ironic if like, it ends up that I'm, I'm stuck yeah. in Ukraine forever, right? But, but I feel like, you know, I've, I've amazing colleagues here who are checking in on me. I speak the language. Um, uh, I have a great apartment. I have access to food. I feel safe here. But for someone who, who doesn't have those things, who's maybe worried about family back home, um, or, who's, who, or who's young, one of the Fulbrighters going home is a college graduate, you know, 22, 23 years old. Like, yeah, his family's like, get home now, <laughs> you know? Um, then, then the calculus changes, right? And then, and then it's worth taking some of those risks. And I think for me, it's just not worth taking that risk yet. I'm sure I will hit a point where hopefully when it gets a little bit more stable in the US, where I feel comfortable taking that step to travel internationally and, and and, and go back to the U.S. I hope that happens. It, it'll it'll happen. Um, who knows when? Uh, who knows when? So, so this has been very interesting. Um, we're right around 20 minutes, and so I thought um, we'd wrap this up with one final question um, for you, Mayhill. Uh, so in what ways has this experience changed what you will tell other scholars about the importance of spending time in situ abroad and maybe more to the point what how does it change what you'll tell um students here at stetson university about studying abroad traveling learning a language uh th these are all things this is what we do um this is uh, this is what we live um and everything that we teach and what we research it all essentially 
essentializes into a, an experience in another place and the importance of place and contacts and um, social skills, all of these things. And so I wonder if your time in quarantine, nine days so far, um, and your experience with Fulbright and your time um, these past um, six months or so yeah. and seven months um, in, in Ukraine. So, so how has this all what change? What, what what changes? Um, I think that's a great question. I think um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, on the one hand, I think I could see I'm picturing myself talking to parents of yeah. kids we want to study abroad, right? And um, on the one hand, it's really scary. It's scary to be abroad in a crisis, and it's scary that that can happen to you or your child. That, that you are away from home and out of your comfort zone and out of your networks when a crisis hits. And that's scary. Um, but I also think that what a pandemic shows is two things. One, how connected we are, right? A virus doesn't wait at the border like, I don't have a passport. I'm not gonna go to this country, right? Um, you say virus in Ukrainian. <laughs> you know, right, exactly. So, so the world is globally connected. Um, and yet it also makes you realize in terms of how states respond to global crises, they all respond differently. Um, borders do emerge, right? I mean, the EU is fascinating. The EU is supposed to be border free, right? And right now those are borders, right? And so yes, borders are constructed, but a global crisis makes you see how they are constructed. And I think also how different people react to crisis, that there are different cultures because of social and economic and historical memory and, and all these issues, there are different ways that people experience crisis and experience life. And you can't get that from an online lesson and you can't get that from the book and you can only get that by being in a place. And I think actually what's really funny is, is despite how globally connected we are through the internet and we're having this Skype actually more and more I think what study abroad should be is is a long-term experience in a country yeah, and that is the only way to really understand the profound ways that cultures are different and I think the people who are going to be making policy and making decisions and and working on public health issues and issues of sustainability and issues of how we handle global crises need to understand how fundamentally differently people respond in different parts of the world. And if we want to help our students do that, they have to spend this, they have to spend time abroad. It occurs to me that um, if you had asked me or anyone in the United States or anywhere um, a few weeks ago about why th things are the way they are, and I yeah. mean, social connections, I mean, this economic connections, um, we would have said something like, well, it, it's natural. Yeah. Uh, and we would have forgotten or blocked out or not thought through the idea that all of these interactions are products of human choice. That is to say that uh, society markets social relations, universities, they don't come about naturally. Um, they don't yeah. suddenly arise like a mushroom in the forest. They're the product of innumerable decisions and some of them are good and some of them are bad. All right, so yeah. so, so one, one more reason to appreciate and cherish and preserve the um, heterogeneity, I hate the word diversity, uh, the, the heterogeneity of economic modes and social modes is that they might come in handy much as um we always talk about biodiversity um yeah. who knows um what we'll need 10 years from now 50 years from now um, um uh, and so in in a way um uh, this connection with other cultures this importance of uh, not not just not just experiencing but appreciating other yeah modes, um is a lot like um it's a lot a lot like evolution um 
uh, um, it's not apparent which traits at any moment evolution will perpetuate and which traits will disappear. And I think it's, um, it's important that we keep all of these different models alive and their peculiarity and their specificity um, so that they're there in case we need them in the future. And maybe that's... Or, or at that's, least we study them, right? At <laughs> least we study them. <laughs> you know, we don't want to be too Darwinian, right? But but at least we're studying, we're aware that there are different models. There, we're aware that there are different societies. Yeah. And I think that um, it is it is profoundly humbling, right, in a time of global crisis to realize how little we know. Yeah, and how important it is to know stuff. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's important to know stuff. Right. And 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 that that knowledge is hard and nuanced and difficult and we have to work to get it. Yeah, we just had two super educated, thoughtful people say it's important to know stuff. Um, <laughs> I might I might have to title entitle this blog um, this uh, podcast. It's, it's um, important which, to know stuff. It's, it's it important is. stuff. <laughs> so 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 um, Dr. Fowler, thank you for spending um, the last 25 minutes um, talking about your time there in Leaf. And I'll, I'll, I'll post this in various places. Um, and um, um, I'll talk to you soon, Neha. Awesome. OK, I hope I get to talk to you in, in reality soon. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop recording, but we'll, we'll continue okay. to talk for a second.